Okay. All right. Um, we're very happy today to have to start our seminar series um, with Kei Chiro giving a talk on an algebra of observables for the sitter space. Please, Kei Chiro. Yeah. Um, thank you uh, for giving me an opportunity to, get, to give a talk in a seminar. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the um, algebra of observables for the sitter space based on um, uh, re based on the recent paper. So the main references is the first one. So this is the main pa paper that I'm going to talk about. And, and, only, and the part that I'm going to talk about is only the uh, first part of this paper or the most basic part of the paper um, because um, these three works, these are the recent progress on quantum gravity from the perspective of uh, operator algebra, which is a little bit mathematical. So in this talk, um, uh, I will um, talk about some mathematical tools, but, um, in, but I decided not to talk every uh, aspects of this talk because this paper is somewhat um, mathematically heavy. So, um, so if you are interested in the recent advancement of quantum gravity uh, from operator algebra, uh, I suggest you to take a look at these other two papers as well. Okay, and also this paper is the very nice um, review paper on the algebraic methods on QFT, which is the basis of, uh, of these talks, uh, of these papers. Okay, so, Today, I'm going to talk about basically three things. I'm going to do three things first. I'm going to specify what the main questions that this paper is asking, and then I will motivate these questions. And then I will talk, talk about von Neumann algebra and physics. So the mathematical tools that we, we will use or they used in the paper are called von Neumann algebra. So I'll talk about a little bit of von Neumann algebra and how they are used in physics. And then we will apply those tools to understand what do we mean by saying observable algebras of local quantum field theory. Um, but especially in this paper, it's not just the algebra of quantum field theory, but the algebra of local quantum field theory. In addition, it's the quantum, uh, quantum field theory, including gravity. And that's, um that's the most important part of this uh work also i said it's entropy however um i don't think i will have enough time to talk about the details of the entropy that they derived in the paper so i will only mention the type of entropy that we expect to get from um from them from them and algebras okay so to explain for this part, we will consider two cases. One is that the algebra, I won't tell you what the observable algebra is, but the um, first we will look at the algebra on the pseudo space as a fixed background space time, means that the algebra only contains the quantum field theory, like the matters and such. But then after that, we start including the gravitational effect in the algebra and see what we get. Okay. So main questions in the paper. So we have two very big questions. Um, one is how can one calculate the black hole entropy and make sense of it? And two, why is it the entanglement entropy is ill-defined in QFT, but well-defined once gravity is included? So um, uh, to motivate these two questions, I will explain what they mean and yeah, what they mean. Okay. But basically what this paper is doing is that to answer these two questions, they use operator algebra uh, of black hole and cosmology to understand, uh, to, to provide the answer for these two. Yeah, okay. Um, if you guys have any questions, please stop me anytime. Okay, so um, just one thing before the motivation. Um, Maybe I shouldn't have this later on, but uh, 
Um, basic approach and methods, um, like I was keep saying, we are going to use all operator algebras, and especially there is a special type of algebra called Fonemann algebra. And this Fonemann algebra has three types. Uh, there are type one, type two, type three. And I'll tell you um, definitions of these three later on and a few properties of them, um, but they have these three types. Type one, um, roughly speaking, or maybe I don't have to be rough, um, but type one is uh, often used for quantum to describe quantum mechanics. And uh, you can, un you can uh, roughly speaking, you can consider type one von Neumann algebra knows the microscopic physics. So ideally, if we know um, type one von Neumann algebra black hole, that would be very good. But unfortunately, it's not the case so far. And uh, what is the which uh, type of algebra that describe black hole physics is so far um, uh, is understood uh, is type two. And this is the recent uh, progress made by uh, Edward Witten and his collaborators. And type three is this is a very um, a uh, very difficult type of difficult type of Fonemann algebra, and it is used to understand local quantum field theory. And uh, this is somewhat famous. Um, back, uh, this is famous uh, in nineties. This is very uh, well studied, but it is very difficult to deal with. So we it, we don't want to have type three, but um, we don't want to have type three. Um, so black hole physics is type two. So it's it's okay, not too bad. And I will explain, but each type has different uh, entropy, uh, different uh, types of entropies are de uh, de term defined. And in this talk, what we're gonna uh, focus on is type two one, okay. And this is the quote from Edward Witten in his paper. But the observable algebras outside the black hole horizon being type two means that uh, we don't know, we do not understand the microstates of black hole. So we don't understand the microscopic physics of it, but we do have a framework to analyze black hole entropy. So this is, um, I think it's a good, um, somewhat a message to use type two here. Okay. so. So motivate, so let me motivate the first question. How can one calculate the black hole entropy and make sense of it? So starting from Bekenstein, um, uh, by defining the, sorry, this is not, uh, defining entropy to understand the uh, second law of um, dynamics in the context of black hole, he has defined the um, entropy of black hole and said that the, it is proportional to the area. However, um, he uh, and then he has extended this entropy to the generalized entropy. entropy. It looks like this, and um, uh, so this first term is proportional to area, and then the other term is the entropy outside of the black hole. So the this uh, expression is motivated to satisfy the second law in the case where you have a matter outside the black hole. Okay, so um, of course there, there's a lot of work uh, for the black hole entropy. Um, so there's a Hawking, there's a Hawking calculation. Hawking calculated the entropy for Hawking radiation. There's a lot of things like holographic entropy, all that. But um, here I'm not going to mention about it, but um, the understanding black hole entropy or its behavior is important. Yes, uh, question? Yes, uh, um, is there an underlying assumption about, let's say, the geometrical nature of the black hole that leads to this equation? And if one can make a different assumption, maybe they could lead to a, to a different uh, formula? Like, is it assumed to be a compact object uh, uh, what's the, what are the underlying assumptions? Um, sorry, uh, 
uh, so are you asking sorry the all the quality of audio wasn't that good so maybe i misheard maybe. what you said but what yes i was i was asking what are the underlying assumptions uh -huh. about what kind of geometrical object is the black hole that leads to this equation like do they assume like a solid compact object what are the, the geometrical assumptions geometrical that, assumptions e, about, e, uh, ab, about what, what type of an object a black hole is ah, ah okay okay good good so uh one one case um is so basically the black hole so the black hole that they calculate the basic one could be a, a um short short black hole so it is the geometry of the uh so you have an einstein equation and then you solve that equation and you get the geometry right so um that's so the solution of einstein equation uh sorry, geometry if, I, about, yeah. if i may uh have yeah, yeah. So this this analysis of type two being associated with horizons, I think Kjer will go over it in more detail. But for the most part, it's based on holographic black holes. So these are this is based on some sort of semi-classical analysis in ADS-CFT. So once he goes over it, if he does, it will become clear what the assumptions are. It's going to be exactly the same standard holography. Yeah. Is that? Is that the assumption that you're asking? Or? Yes, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I, I'll, I'll wait for later. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, um, please ask me afterwards if you still um, have questions. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so here I, 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 I drew, drew two pictures that is, um, is, um, these are the examples. So um, for the entropy, um, what you are going to calculate this area A um, is the area of black hole horizons. Um, so in case if you're considering the black hole, um, so this is the picture of two-sided black hole. But if you're considering the entropy of black hole, this area is going to be the um, area of black hole horizon. And S out is any um, um, uh, is the entropy of the matter outside of the black hole. So basically, the entropy uh, for this case, um, which corresponds to the um, a space time with cosmological constant, uh, negative cosmological constant, um, we're considering the entropy of um, black hole in the uh, black hole in the space-time with a, a black hole in asymptotic flat space-time. And so this is, this this was uh, studied a lot. And then in the case of, um, so in the case of, uh, this has the holographic description in this two-sided case. So you have a black hole inside. This is the black hole horizon. And this is um, right side of the space time. This is left side of the space time. In a horographic description, you have um, here you have asymptotic boundary of the space time, and you have CFT, or uh, you or you have a boundary. So you have a boundary dual dual boundary theory uh, living here. The same thing can be said to here as well. So in this case, um, if you calculate uh, the assumption we're in, in is um, uh, in the semi-classical limit means that uh, G Newton uh, going to zero or uh, the limit that G Newton becomes very, very small. So the leading order of the entropy is this area term and you have the corrections coming along. Um, yeah. And this was the story for the black hole entropy. But now um, this uh, this paper studies the entropy associated to the cosmological horizon. 
So in this case, uh, so which case do we have that kind of situation? So if you consider a cosmological constant to be positive, you have the uh, maximally symmetric solution for Einstein equation is going is called the Cedar space, which I will explain uh, later in detail. So in this case, you don't have um, this black hole and you don't have uh, asymptotic uh, boundary in the Cedar case. So it is unclear how the holographic description applies in the Cedar uh, space time. But um, here, uh, fortunately, we have a horizon here, which is called cosmological horizon. And so when we want to calculate the entropy, um, this generalized entropy, we're going the area A will correspond to the area of cosmological horizon. And S out is the entropy um, outside of this horizon. Okay. And then um, what, uh, so I told you that the local quantum field theory is type three. So basically the algebra that is associated to this space-time region or this space-time region can be considered as, uh, should be type three, but in semi-classical limit, meaning that if you turn on some class, uh, gravitational effect, um, and then if you include that effect into your algebra, you start seeing that the sorry type of algebra uh, changes from type three to type two. So this is uh, the work that the, uh, this is the um, yeah this is the work the recent work by Witten. And um, I had I had a question. Uh, yes. For the cosmological horizon, the generalized entropy would it be the it would be S n right? You would have like the fields inside the horizon. Fields or inside just... the horizon. Because the cosmo cosmological horizon would be something like being inside a black hole, and then you're looking at the horizon from the inside, right? Or is it still uh, S out? No, still S out. Um, so it's. No, I think it's still S out. So you, you, so if you have a matter outside here, or if, if you have a matter that the observer can access to, then those are those will contribute to S out. All right. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So we are looking at observers that are outside the cosmological horizon. Outside the, I, I mean, yeah, I will explain later, but the cosmological horizon um, here, here in the Cedar space case, um, it depends on which observer you pick. So okay, okay. based on the observer, you have different cosmological horizon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So that's the motivation on modeling the black hole or cosmological entropy using algebra. So this is the um, zero step, maybe our first step to answer this question. How can one calculate the black hole entropy and make sense of it? Now, uh, the second one is the mathematical object called crossed product. This is the object um, studied in the field of quantum and algebra. And I, I'm not going to uh, discuss detail about this cross product because it is somewhat involved and I don't think I will have time. So I'll just tell you what it, um, how, how it is used um, in their story. So this um, cross product um, is somewhat motivated to answer this question. Uh, second question. Why is it that the entanglement entropy is ill-defined in QFD, but well-defined once gravity is included? So here uh, I have very um, naive discussion, but um, I hope this is helpful. So entanglement entropy of QFD um, is ill-defined, especially the entanglement entropy of local, uh, entanglement entropy of QFD of the local region is ill-defined. 
it's due to the ultraviolet divergences. So if you want to calculate the entanglement entropy of, um, so let's say you consider a constant time slice, and then you divide that region into two, A and B. And if you want to calculate the entropy of A, this is L defined, and you can calculate that entropy. But um, the similar thing, uh, you can think of um, somewhat similar case in the black hole. So you have a black hole, and then um, this is the black hole, this is the singularity. Let's say this is the horizon. And you want to calculate the entropy of the black hole. So if you calculate the, if you want to calculate the entropy, then uh, from the area law, you can have, so this is, this part is proportional to A, and then this uh, S out is the uh, entropy contributed by the matter. But what's important in this story is that the, this generalized entropy is somewhat, uh, is the, is finite because the denormalization of the uh, G Newton and then S, uh, denormalization G Newton um, have the ultraviolet divergence contribution and S out this part will have the divergence part as well. And then they cancel out in this formula. So um, in, if, you, if you consider this uh, black hole entropy and considering this contribution, um, gravitational contribution, um, this entropy becomes finite. So now the question is, well, why is it so? So to answer this, this people, um, uh, Wittens and his collaborators um, try to answer this question by saying that, let's say you start from type three and then you can do, there's something called the cross product. You do a procedure to do, to construct cross product. Then you get some, uh, you get type two, um, algebra in this case. And then um, type three, it is known that the entropy is not um, defined, it's, it's ill-defined, but type two, the entropy is defined. So by doing this construction, you're, you can make uh, entropy ill-defined, you can change the story um, from type three to type two. So the cross product uh, is useful, um, is somewhat useful to explain this part. But um, so this, this construction is somewhat um, uh, complicated, so I'm not going to talk about this, but oh, yeah. this is how it is used. Do you yeah. mind if I interrupt? So yes, it's worth saying that the cross product is really enlarging the algebra. So you start with the algebra of quantum field theory, you introduce a generator that generates mm -hmm. some sort of a unitary flow. Yes, yes. Now you add this generator to your algebra, and then all of a sudden the enlarged thing has this cross product, what well, you, you make it close, you know, the closure of that is some sort of a cross product algebra. Now there's a formal definition, but what it is is really conceptually easy, you're adding a generator that generates yeah, yeah. so you're right. enlarging it. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, so that's right. Um, so, right, so generators being uh, conserved charges. So if you turn on, I, I won't comment on this, but if you um, turn on the gravitational effect, um, uh, if you consider um, gravitational effect, um, and then include it into your algebra, it means that you're including the conserved charge coming from gravity, which is the conserved charge of the killing vector. So you, you're adding the charges to algebra. So that's what uh, I think Nima said, you are uh, enlarging the algebra. Um, yeah. So the goal of this uh, talk, is um, to see, or it is, I don't, I cannot, I don't think I have time to prove it, or I don't think it's useful or meaningful to prove it here, but um, we'll see um, how, uh, we'll, we'll see like basic part of the construction of the algebra for the series space. So this is, uh, so the statement that we will see uh, 
In particular, is the algebra of resolvables of a static patch on a decider space in semi-classical limit is von Neumann algebra of type 2 one. Okay, so this is uh, so to start with, um, we'll review what the unit of star algebra is um, from just by the example. So let's think of a single qubit and you can construct an algebra. So the algebra uh, here, algebra, so single cube, to describe the single qubit, the operators you have is Pauli matrices, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, and identity. And uh, the algebra here, if I write like this, this means that the algebra A is generated by these four operators, identity, sigma x, y, z, over complex numbers, satisfying, these are the basics, basic mathematical operations that you can have. So associative, distributive, I think this is um, okay for you. And for the star here means that it's a dagger operation. Um, so mathematician likes to write uh, star mark instead of dagger, but you can think of it as a dagger. And unit all means that you have identity included in your algebra. So unit all star algebra means that um, you the, the algebra is closed under addition multiplication uh, with scalar scalars, and you have dagger operation allowed and you have identity in it. So that's the unit of star algebra. Um, yeah, example of the unit of star algebra. So um, this is the um, definition of unit of star algebra. It's a, a set of all bounded operators that are closed under addition, multiplication, and star operation. So the, these are what we have seen. More. And then the phonemon algebra is a special type of star algebra. In case of finite dimensional case, they are the same thing. Um, yeah. But um, so this is the, I think, simplest definition for the phonemon algebra you can think of. Uh, you can, uh, yeah, think of the phonemon algebra A on Hilbert space H is a star subalgebra. Star subalgebra means it's just the star algebra, but it's smaller than some smaller than uh, star algebra. Within so here, phonemon algebra always has an identity, and it's the algebra of all bounded operators on H. The bounded means that here it means that the normal operator is uh, uh, is always finite, or the eigenvalues of the operator uh, is finite. So in this case, uh, the special condition for the fundamental algebra to be this equation, this prime means that it, um, it's a set of um, operators which commute with any operators in A. So if you have A prime, then this operator A prime commutes with all the elements in A. And then if you consider the double prime and you do the same procedure again, and then if A prime, double prime equals to A, then you say that's the form of an algebra. And here, um, the reason why I'm describing this definition is I want to introduce the notion of a factor. So um, if you're not familiar with math or if you did not like math that much, you don't have to um, remember all this, of course, but only the word that I want you to remember is a factor. So the factor is um, intersection between A and A prime. Um, if A and A prime, intersection of A and A prime are trivial or it only has the multiples of identity, then A is called factor. Yes. Question? Yeah, can you uh, explain what does the intersection of the algebra mean mm -hmm. about the relation of the operators that constitute the algebra? Ah, so intersection here means that um, you take, um, if you have a common op uh, operator, if you have an operator common in both operators, you say that's in the intersection of two operators. So let's say if A 
Um, so let's think of the single qubit algebra. So A was generated by I, sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z. And then you, let's say you consider the all algebra A prime. The operators that commute with this is only identity. Do you agree? Yes. So in this case, if you take the intersection of these two, the only only the operator that is common in both algebra is identity. So you have identity here. So this intersection is um, similar to the intersection of a set of set two sets. So in other words, A is a factor if it has trivial center. Center mm -hmm. of an algebra is a set of operators in the algebra that commute with everything else. Yeah. Okay. So these are the types of Feynman algebra. So we have, I said I have, we have three types, type one, type two, type three, and each type, um, there is um, each type you have a factor. It's a special type of Feynman algebra, and this factor can be further categorized into type one D and type one infinity, or type two one, type two infinity, and type three zero, type one, a uh, type three one, type three lambda. So um, you don't have to um, remember all these uh, classifications, but here's the uh, usage in physics. So type one D is used to describe quantum mechanics, for example, like cubed it. So if you want to, if you have, want to have algebra of cubed, uh, several cubed bit system, then a single cubed system or a cubed system, you can use type 1D. And for type 1 infinity, it is used to describe harmonic oscillators. And these are the nice type of uh, factors that we want to have, but um, so so the type next type is type two, type two one, type two infinity. So type two one. So basically, type two applications of type two in physics are not that much known, but uh, recent development of recent work by Witten, um, they found that the type two one corresponds to observable algebra in the serial space and type to infinity corresponds to observable algebra outside of black hole in asymptotic flat space. And type three, type three zero and type three lambda is something that we don't have a good physical application. So let's not care about them. But type three one, um, describes the algebra or observable algebra of uh, quantum field theory in the local region of space time. So the local local quantum field theory means quantum field theory in local region of space time. That's what it means. So Kichur, just one little comment. Type yes. 3 lambda appears in the thermodynamic limit of finite quantum systems. Ah. So your type 1D, when you write, when you write quantum mechanics, what you mean is a D-level quantum mechanics, finite dimensional quantum mechanics. If you take a thermodynamic limit of that, you often get type three lambda. And uh -huh. if you fine tune it, you could get type two one as well, but you have to fine tune it. Uh, I see, I see. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so this is the summary of the classification, but uh, and its properties. So why I'm keep saying type one are uh, good is because it's uh, it has a irreducible representation, means that it has the um, minimal projections or finite dimensional projections. And you can define trace density matrix tensor product, which you're familiar with to describe physics. So it's very nice. And we have, we can define entropy, which is a complement entropy that we're familiar with. But in case of type two, we don't have a reducible representation. It means that the, the projections, you can find a finite 
uh, dimension projections, but you can't find the minimal uh, smallest projections. So, um, yeah, so the projections are continuous in type two. However, still in that case, we have trace density matrix and tensor product, but the entropy that is associated to this type is um, for type two one, uh, you have finite um, entropy, but it has um, constant shift to each entropy. And for especially for type two one, um, you can have maximum entropy. And then um, for the entropy of the pseudo space, you can, uh, it is known that it has a maximum uh, entropy. So that is why Witten is motivated you to use type two algebra to model um, entropy associated to the shooter space. Okay. Sorry, maybe, maybe it's worth noting that uh, the entropy of type two one by definition, as we will see is negative. That's what, what Keichura is means by maximum entropy here. Um, um, no, sorry, I, well, um, sorry, I don't know that. So the way, well, we 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 can uh, talk about this later, but. Basically, okay. uh, what happens is that your vacuum state of the type 2, 1 has the maximum entropy. We often define that in math, we often define that to be zero. Then all the excitations only lower the entropy. And mm -hmm. that's why in the math notation, they have negative entropy. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, I see, I see what you mean. Yes, okay, okay, yeah, I see. Okay, so that's the classification. Okay, so um, this is the last math part. So um, I think it's good for you. But okay, so in this story, I have a lot of things here, um, writing here. But what we only care is this three objects. So we have algebra. We consider a vacuum state. And we consider the Hilbert space. These three things are what we are going to care about. So if you if, if you feel like you, you've lost in the talk, um, try to keep uh, try to uh, tr track which object I'm uh, talking right now, and then so that so I think this this will be helpful. Uh, yeah, the three objects are important in this story. So the reason why these three stories are important uh, or enough is is because of us as is because of us as, as follows so first um so when you study physics in terms of, in the language of operator algebra you start with um observable algebra of your system the observable algebra of your system is the um, set of self adjoint operators in your system so which means that if you have operator a and a dagger self adjoint operators is here. So you collect this kind of operators and then you construct the algebra. Now, um, only having an algebra is not enough to explore um, many uh, explore properties. So what you're going to do is do you pick a vacuum omega. And if you pick a vacuum omega, um, and which is cyclic and separating, um, but let's not care about this for now. But if you pick a vacuum omega and then you act all the operators on this vacuum and construct Hilbert, uh, and then you can construct the Hilbert space. So this procedure is something, so this procedure, well, what it's doing is that you're constructing a representation of this algebra using this state. A state or vector state or a vacuum that you know, if you want to call and this is sometimes called uh, and then there's a special type of construction or representation called gns representation and 
if you have tensor product and density matrix, it's very intuitive. So you can, this GNS construction is a map from operator to the vector state that can, you can, and then you can represent operator A as A tensor identity. And A is acting on one side of the Hilbert space. This identity part is acting on the other side of the Hilbert space. So something, anything that commutes with A is represented by identity tensor A. So it is obvious that A tensor identity commutes with I tensor identity, uh, A, identity tensor A. Now the expectation value, um, if you consider this form and you, you can, in, in some in special case where you have density matrix, for example, like type one or type two, you can um, make a correspondence between the expectation of the vacuum in this Hilbert space H omega equals to, um, trace of density matrix, uh, trace of row A. Row is the density matrix that has the information of the vacuum. And then you have operator A here. And this vacuum can be written in this form. So the state omega vacuum is related to um, density matrix in this form. Now, one thing um, that is important here is that we said we pick a vacuum, but sorry. But if you have, uh, if you want to, uh, if you have a physical system and if you want to talk about the dynamical system with some Hamiltonian, then choosing a Hamiltonian means that um, if you pick a Hamiltonian, you can always find the corresponding ground state for the vacuum. So the choosing Hamiltonian is equal to choosing a vacuum. And choosing a vacuum means here as we, Shown here, if you pick a vacuum, you can make a representation of algebra. So it's like choosing a representation of algebra. So this, in, in the usual case, you can pick a Hamiltonian based on the system you have, but in gravity, Hamiltonian is observer dependent, so there is no unique vacuum. So you need to consider which vacuum to pick to construct um, a representation of your algebra. Okay, so here the summary that I have talked is observable algebra can be described by von Neumann algebra. Uh, von Neumann algebra has different types and we're interested in type two. Then entropy of local algebra. Uh, okay, so let's not, I think I didn't talk, talk about this, but let's not care about this. But uh, what's important here is this three object algebra, state and Hilbert space, this three things. Okay, so this was the mathematical part. Um, here comes the physics. So here the statement again. The, we will see the algebra of observables of a static patch on the zero space in semi-classical limit is from them an algebra of type two one. So this is the thing that we will we are going to see. So what is the zero space? So the zero space um, is uh, maximally symmetric solution of uh, Einstein equation with a negative, uh, sorry, positive cosmological constant. So here, this is the global coordinates of the zero space in D dimension space time. So here, as you see, the metric depends on time. So um, if you're familiar with the uh, uh, GR, if you have a positive cosmological constant, this uh, metric or the solution of Einstein equation describes the um, expanding universe. Because you have time here and it's a cosh, so it's expanding. And you can draw a Penrose diagram by having a conform of flat metric. And this is the Penrose diagram for the conform of flat metric where you have conformal infinity here and down here. And then this part um, is like a horizon. And then this idea of horizon comes into play when you consider a static patch. So this is a patch on this uh, decider space. And this patch only describes um, this part of the Cedar space. And this patch is the um, metric for the observer 
let's say um, the observer at time in negative infinity is in the past here, and then the observer will travel this geodesic to reach the end of point Q after an infinite time later. And then the observer can access to only this region. So when I said observable algebra, it, it, mean it, is, um, uh, it is understandable if your algebra contains the information uh, which observer can access to. So the, observe, the support of algebra that we are going to consider is the static patching here. Okay. So here, the important, part, important point in the story is that the global coordinates, since it depend on, since it depends on the on time here, it, it global coordinates does not have us or, or sorry, we don't have a global um, healing vector, Glo time global time like healing vector. So we don't have a good definition of a time translation, but here in the static patch metric, these metric, this metric does not depend on time. So you have a time like healing vector. So here uh, using that healing vector, you can have um, Hamiltonian that describes the time translation on one patch in this direction, and then the time translation of this patch on the other direction. So this, again here, the important part is that the static patch is the region where an observer can access. So the, the algebra of observables to construct is supported on a particular choice of static patch. So to look at the type of observable algebra, we consider two cases. So one is one case is purely a quantum field. The other case is just a um, quantum field in uh, the other case is the quantum field, algebra of quantum field, including gravity in the semi-classical limit. So here are quantum fields without gravity. So we have um, the pseudo space as a background and the uh, local algebra A is supported on here, the static patch. So this A is what we have here. Suppose all the operators, bounded operators that are supported on this region will be inside of this A and A prime. All the operators will be supported on here because the, any operators living here, especially uh, space like separated from the operators in the other patch, the, other, the patch of the other side. So they should commute. So that's why we have A prime. This is the algebra that commute, all the operators that commute with A. So you have. A supported here and you have A prime supported here. And here, these regions are local regions of the space time. So this observable algebra is type three one or type three that I described before. Now, these are the algebras, but now which vacuum we have? So the vacuum that we are thinking is now we, we have picked the observer that travels this line. So we have picked the observer. So we had a vacuum for that observer. It's called the Bunch Davis um, vacuum. This is the Euclidean vacuum for pseudo space. Okay. So the vacuum we have picked is this the pseudo space. So we have two objects determined. So here in this uh, talk, I'm not i uh, going to talk about the details of H, um, but there, there are many um, important points discussed in the paper about Hilbert's structure of Hilbert space. But one thing I want to um, uh, make, and I, I wanted to tell is that this, if you have A, if you have picked A and omega, you can always uh, construct um, operators that is called operator, that is called the modular operator here. And this plays important role in the rest of the talk. So we have this, we have A already, and we define an anti-unitary operator that acts like this. 
And it's known that this has a polar, the unique polar decomposition and you do the polar decomposition, you have, you get two operators. One is modular conjugation, the other is modular operator. Each of them has physical interpretation, but let's only consider a modular operator here. And the important part is that it depends on uh, the state that you defined here. So S anti-unitary operator depends on omega, J delta, these two depends on omega as well. So they depend on the state that you picked. And this modular operator can be written in this form, where this H is called um, modular Hamiltonian. So later on, what's, more, what's important is this, uh, the identification of uh, a modular Hamiltonian being proportional to the Hamiltonian that we have um, induced by considering the, sorry, considering the um, time-like Killian vector for the static batch. So this H will have relation to the modular Hamiltonian. So that is um, really, that is going to be important by uh, automorphism group. So there is a unitary transformation group um, um, naturally defined once you have algebra and once you pick a state omega and a. So you have constructed modular operator and then you can think of the flow for uh, operator flow of the operator here, like this modular, this is called the modular flow. And because since you have modular Hamiltonian, you can have this kind of flow, which looks like the um, time translation uh, of the Hamil usual Hamiltonian. But this H mod is the modular Hamiltonian, which is not um, equal to the usual Hamiltonian. That's related in some case. And it's action to, so what's important here is that in this action is ergodic when the algebra is type D1. So if you have quantum local, if your algebra uh, is defined for local quantum field theory, then that's type D1. So this modular flow is uh, ergodic. And when I say ergodic, what it means is that this flow can bring this A into any operators in A, in, in the algebra A. So you can access to uh, this flow will mix all operators into all. So that's automorphism. It's mapping to itself. So this means that any operator, sorry, this is H mod. So any operator that is invariant under this modular flow, in this case, because it's ergodic, it A is, um, doesn't have to be proportional, it's equal, but the only invariant part is going to be complex number identity, complex multiples of identity. Teacher, so can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Do you literally mean this equation or do you mean the limit of, do you mean the modular average? Do you mean the modular? Uh, modular average, uh, modular average, yes. Yeah, that's what you mean. Yes. Okay. So, Thank you. so what you mean is the limit of t going to infinity of one over t integral from minus t to t. Ah, yes, 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 that's right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And this is going to t, t, and yeah. Yes. So this is the modular flow average. It's going to be the identity. So why is this story important? So this story is important in the uh, black hole case, uh, in this the zero space, or um, in the black hole case where you have this type of structure, where you have this bifurcate horizon structure. So the analytic, so you have uh, the zero space, d-dimensional space time, the zero d-dimensional the zero space time. If you consider um, analytic continuation of this geometry, you will get the Euclidean sphere as the d-dimensional sphere. And then this time-like killing vector becomes a rotation of the equator of SD. So you have, you'll have this sphere and then this uh, 
time lag killing vector, because of this analytic continuation, it corresponds to the rotation of the equator here. And that all corresponds to the thermal circle um, of Euclidean, uh, therm thermal circle and Euclidean path integral. So, the th so that induces the thermality of the state um, of the Dossier space, bunch Davis state, this is the vacuum state that we picked, where the periodicity two pi, L, L is the um, DS uh, radius, the series radius for the series space. And then, um, and then this, and then this rotation in the Euclidean space, because it's induced by time like helium vector, it's associated to the Hamilton. So there is a suggest, um, so there's a, um, the, the, I will jump to this part, but the uh, modular Hamiltonian we have defined in the previous slide, it is related to um, this Hamiltonian H and beta ds in this form. So the modular Hamiltonian is going to be beta ds of H. So actually the, um, and then like I said, the modular operator will depend on the state that you picked. So the state, the vacuum we picked is psi ds. It's the bounce Davis state. So the modular flow, a modular operator depends on psi ds again. And this has, and then the modular, so psi ds was in the form of H mod. And what I'm claiming here is that this modular operator is, a uh, modular operator looks like beta ds of h, which looks like the thermal distribution. All right. Basically, what you're saying is that h mod is del t. h not is del t. Del t. H. E, yes. In the notation, in the coordinates that you wrote down for the uh, for the <clears throat> a patch, mm -hmm. for the static patch, h mod is just del t. Yes, yes. Uh, that's right, that's right. Yes, thank you. The LT, yes. It's the king like the field, yes. So the modular flow that uh, that we have used for, so like I said, once you have algebra A and the state DS, you can construct the mo uh, one parameter automorphism group or the modular automorphism group uh, with this. So it's the modular flow with the Hamiltonian or the Hamiltonian induced by time lag getting better, beta del, uh, so del T. Okay. So why is this um, modular flaw or the modular Hamiltonian important in the story? So this will come into play when we consider algebra when you uh, algebra with the effect of gravity. So with Gravity, how does the story change? So now we want to start turning on the gravitational effect. So if you want to add the gravitational effect into here, what's most important is that the automorphism of the zero space have to be treated as gauge constraints. So roughly speaking, very, very simply speaking, the op uh, operate algebra of, of observables of the static patch it's not just a set of self adjoint operators anymore. It should respect the gauge symmetry because you have start including the um, gravitational effect and then the gravity or the graviton, those, those are considered as a quantum fields and included in the algebra. So you need to think the gauge invariant part of uh, gauge invariant operators. So, the group the, or the diffeomorphism that we have. <clears throat> um, uh, seem, if you um, naively think about it, then you might think that the whole, we should think of whole group of the Cedar space, but this is not true because the, the group, <clears throat> because the um, support of the observable algebra we're thinking is only on, on a static patch. So the group that we are going to consider is actually a subgroup of the sphere space, um, which we which I denoted the GP. This is the static patch group of static patch. And this is isomorphic to 
the time translation RT, which is uh, which is coming from the timeline killing vector that I was keep saying, and SOD minus one. This is the rotation or uh, rotation around the observer. <clears throat> So um, here, what's important um, in our story, if you pick the automorphism constructed by this RT, which is time translation or the boost in the zero space, this A is what you have. And then you consider um, in gauge invariant part of this observable algebra, because the modular flow that we consider acts ergodically, we only this algebra, gauge invariant algebra is going to be just a simple identity or the complex multiples of identity. And this is not interesting. So um, what they have done to make uh, algebra more interesting is um, somewhat um, ad hoc because what they are going to do is they add observable de degrees of freedom by their hand to the algebra. So first thing they have done is that they modify the Hamiltonian that they have. So the H is the Hamiltonian that comes from the time-like killing vector and H observable here, uh, sorry, H observer is the Hamiltonian for observer. And then they model the Hamiltonian of observer as just a positive linear number. So the positive, they, they have, so Q, it, so this makes sense as an observer, the like simplest Hamiltonian that you can think of because it's uh, lower bounded or it's bounded from below. So it's fine as an energy of the observer. So the in this case, if you are now adding the observer's degrees of freedom, so the form of the algebra is now looks like A tensor conducted with, um, with a set of uh, bounded functions on positive half real line. So this um, state of the observer, because Q is positive real number, the state of observer is going to be bounded function uh, acting on Q. So F of Q is a state of observer. So this is something. Now the operator should act on the state. So any bounded operator acting on F, let's call it over or something, is going to be the operator. Or maybe I should just say F or, or yeah, O is fine. Or acting on the function. So this is um, a very ad hoc way of constructing algebra by hands. And they are claiming that this algebra, so once you construct this algebra, and then you consider the gauge invariant part, now it's the uh, gauge invariant part of this algebra, and the gauge invariance is now determined by this new Hamiltonian H hat, and they claim that this algebra is type 2, 1. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Just yes. the thing I got completely lost. <clears throat> so you start with R plus. Yes. Right? So you take R plus, then you take the set of square integral functions on R plus. Yes. The square integrable functions on the um, half line, on a half line. Yes. Um, then you take the set of operators that act, that live, that, that map the Hilbert space to itself. That's what is meant mm -hmm. by B of L squared of R plus. <clears throat> yes. And you enlarge your A by these operators. Yes. Confused as, okay. Um, all right, so you could do that. Then, yeah. So you do that, then what? First then, of all, R plus. I didn't quite understand why it's R plus. Oh, the R plus because it's the they want to have this as a Hamiltonian for observer. It's not good to have negative energy of observer. Right? That's why they have it like this. Okay, okay. And then what is the notation? What's, what's the meaning of the notation parentheses to parallel h hat? What does that mean? Yeah. So this is the invariant part, h hat invariant part of this algebra. 
each hat in varying part. So each hat generates a unitary flow. Yes. These are the operators invariant under the unitary flow. Is that what it is? Yes, yes, that's right. <clears throat> so, okay, all right, okay, thanks. Yeah. So this is this is they they call it this is the observer algebra, and yeah. So they call it uh, they they proved that this is type two one using cross the pro something called cross product and Takistaki duality. Um. So I think it's I think I uh, go over went over the time. So I'll, I'll stop talk here, but um. I can talk about the cross product and others um, in um, outside this talk or maybe in the discussion. So if you're interested in, please ask me anytime. Yeah, just for the summary, the algebra on this patch is the phonon is described by phonon and algebra type two one, including uh, gravity. So including gravity means in semi-classical limit. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you so much for the talk teacher. Are there questions? So I have a very basic question. Type two one yeah. has, has finite entropy, right? But uh, the finite, the entropies are negative and that's to be understood as uh, I guess is is the idea that um, we only can compare the entropy of state with pure decider. Mm -hmm. Like we're still not quite finding any number that we could interpret as the entropy of a horizon, the cosmological horizon, or are they finding such a thing? Yeah. Um, wait. Right. So. Uh... So sorry, what's what's your question? Oh, the 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 whole the attempt to the idea to get a type two one a type two algebra mm -hmm. was that you define an entropy. Yeah. Why were you after an entropy? Because you wanted to interpret this to to call this entropy the horizon entropy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And little horizons have entropy the same way that black hole horizons have entropy. Mm -hmm. And what is the final right. answer? So the and the, ah. the, the entropy of the cosmological horizon in the sitter, you supposedly cannot compute that, right? You can probably um, compute the difference of entropy compared to the pure to the sitter vacuum. Or yeah, well, what's the status of that? What do they these guys claim at the end? Yeah, so so here um I think I didn't put sorry, I think I didn't put the um the formal entropy in the slides, but what they do is um so they have type two one, right? Algebra, and they have state. So they construct the state for this algebra, and then they calculate the entropy, and then they make so they don't say they got the answer, but they try to um make an interpretation of the expression that they got comparing to the generalized entropy. So they calculate the entropy based on, purely based on algebra. And then they compare that form to the generalized entropy. Um, let, me, let me ask a question, ask a question differently. So the algebra of type two infinity, you could for for the for type two infinity you could define you could define an entropy, but that entropy is defined only up to a multi uh, up to shift. Mm -hmm. Is that this is the same story true for type two one? Mm. Um, I don't. Um, so to be honest, I I don't know. I need to go back and check. Okay, I, I suspect that you only can compute uh, or you're going to only interpret physically the entropy difference. To get some finite number out of this as the entropy of a horizon or black hole, I mean, black hole horizon, cosmological horizon, requires doing something non perturbative 
constructing a type one, I suspect. <clears throat> that I we see. do not know how to do. I suspect. So I think, I think, yeah, I think what you're saying, I think maybe this. So um, the horizon area, <laughs> horizon entropy for pi. Um, so they claim that this is um, equal to A of DS. This is the uh, cosmological horizon. Wait, no. Okay, okay. Let, let me not say this, but um, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you about this later. I'll, I'll go and check. Okay, any other questions for teacher? If not, let's thank teacher again for the talk. And thanks so much guys for uh, coming to the talk. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat>